Thank you very much. It's always uh, good to start with uh, an applause and uh, a cordial welcome to our annual meeting for new champions, also called Summer Davos 2023. It's our 14th Summer Davos in China. And uh, we're very proud to be able to resume um, our summer Davos, and uh, also in a time where we see that uh, the Chinese economy uh, is again growing after a period uh, of COVID. We have a great panel uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Ngozi will also join us um, shortly. Some logistical challenges uh, this uh, morning. Of course, we would have hoped that uh, the backdrop of this meeting had even been better. I'm then thinking about uh, the global uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic outlook. But um, this panel is about uh, making best out of a situation where we do have growing inflation. We also have growing geopolitical uncertainty. And we also have um, financial uh, challenges around our financial institutions. But um, there's also opportunities uh, when it comes to reviving economic growth. Unfortunately, this year we're seeing economic growth of 2.8% uh, uh, compared to last year, 34 We will have to make sure that uh, we are not moving into like a lost decade. We need to revive growth. And that has to be done also by cooperation. And trade is uh, playing an important part here. For many years, trade was the driving engine for growth. Trade used to grow around 6% uh, per year. Now it's growing 2%. And um, if we introduce new tariffs and uh, like beggar the neighbor approach instead of prosper your neighbor approach, we will not get back uh, on the sustainable growth trajectory. And uh, IMF, International <coughs> Monetary Fund, um, also just uh, came out with a report saying that if we go into a decoupling situation, it will shave off 7% of global GDP. That is like a depression, so that has to be avoided. So to discuss this, the opportunities, but also the challenges, as I said, you really have a great panel. We are so happy uh, that you could uh, join us here during Summer uh, Davos. Uh, on my right-hand side, we have Chris Hipkins, Prime Minister of New Zealand. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Then we have Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, just coming back from, uh, coming from Paris. Uh, so welcome, Madam Prime Minister. We have then, uh, not traveling so far, but uh, coming from one of the fastest growing economies in the world, Prime Minister Pham Min Sheng, Prime Minister of Vietnam. Warm welcome. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, Chairman uh, Shang of uh, SASAC, uh, in charge of uh, uh, many of the important companies in China. Welcome. Hello, everyone. So, uh, maybe uh, start with uh, New Zealand and uh, you, uh, Prime Minister uh, Hipkins. Uh, you just took over as uh, Prime Minister, and I know that you're very passionate about uh, New Zealand also growing a green economy. And uh, how can you see the green transition uh, of your economy as an opportunity to revive growth. Some people think that green will bring down growth and not uh, increase uh, growth. But I, I guess uh, you have thought this through very much. Well, from a New Zealand perspective, a transition to a greener economy is critical for us. Uh, we rely on our clean green reputation and image around the world in order to sell the things that we produce. And increasingly, in a world where awareness of climate change is becoming more and more pronounced every day, consumers are increasingly looking for 
products that are clean and green. So for our exporters, uh, being able to, to market internationally as a clean green brand is vitally important, but we also have to make sure we're backing that up by ensuring that what we produce actually is produced in a way that's clean, green and sustainable. There's also enormous opportunities for our local economy uh, in moving to a more uh, sustainable, greener future. Renewable electricity in New Zealand is, more, is cheaper, more affordable than electricity generated from fossil fuels. So uh, there can be significant um, economic savings to be made through uh, you know, greater, a, drive, a greater energy efficiency drive. And I know that uh, New Zealand uh, is also very active when it comes uh, to trade and trade negotiations, but also establishing a lot of free trade agreements uh, all over the world. How do you see this also in relations to multilateral agreements? It's not coming instead of WTO and multilaterals, uh, I guess? We believe very firmly in an international rules-based system for trade. Uh, multilateral and bilateral trade agreements are incredibly important to New Zealand, and we've been focusing on both of those. Uh, there have been some recent examples of quite big uh, um, uh, bilateral free trade agreements, including a, a free trade agreement here in China that was signed in 2008 and has recently been upgraded in 2021, and other uh, bilateral agreements. But we're also very committed to the role that we can play as part of multilateral trading arrangements. And the uh, CPTPP um, is, an, is a really good example of that. New Zealand was in those negotiations right from the very beginning. Uh, very, very pleased to see the CPTPP come into force. I think the quality of that agreement um, is, uh, is evident in the number of additional countries that now want to join it. Um, and so we see that there's absolutely room for both bilateral and multilateral trading. Are you one of those worried about this decoupling notion too? In what respect? Yeah, that, that can shave off a lot of growth if you have the geopolitical uh, situation leading to new tariffs and protectionism, it can shave off growth. How do you see the G2, for example, coming together, uh, US and China, it seems like uh, there is um, some uh, disconnect there for the time being. I think we would like to see a world that continues to be open and outward looking. Um, there is a trend in some parts of the world to be more inward looking. Some of that, I think, is driven by the challenges that we all face as a planet. So where there's more uncertainty, where there's a greater drive towards security and resilience, uh, it can encourage countries to look inwards for the solutions to those problems. But actually, uh, I think looking outward is how we're going to solve those problems. I think the whole world will need to work together to solve challenges around climate change, to solve challenges around uh, a shifting population demographic. Um, as the, the nature of, uh, of population growth changes quite dramatically in the coming decades, the whole world is going to have to grapple with that. And so I don't think an inward-looking focus for any country is going to serve their longer-term interests particularly well. Thank you very much. Uh, let me then move to Prime Minister Mia Motley from Barbados. Uh, congratulations uh, on the meeting uh, in Paris where you were hosting together with um, President Macron, new global financing pact. I think you were made uh, some um, progress. We have been waiting since Copenhagen for the 100 billion US dollars a year. Uh, maybe we're closer to getting there. On top, I think we need a couple of trillions to make sure that we are successful with the decarbonization. And Madam Prime Minister, you said several uh, times that uh, we need a green transition that leaves no one behind. Yep. Uh, where do we stand on this? Also after Paris, are we on track? And how can we combine uh, the green transition, decarbonization, with also jobs and economic growth? I think that, first of all, thank you for having me this morning. And I think that we are all agreed that first and foremost, the world is facing a climate crisis. And what is required is urgent action. But we can't take action if we don't have oxygen. And the oxygen is, in fact, the capital, the finance that's needed in order to be able to fuel the activities both of the public sector and the private sector. The public sector will focus on adaptation and being able to make the country and the people more resilient. But at the same time, that is going to mean investments within the country by the private sector themselves, 
Um, let's take hotels that are on beaches. Um, if the coastal erosion is bad, their revenue is going to be compromised. So there are some instances where the private sector will benefit from increased savings or um, to avert loss of revenue with respect to adaptation. But mitigation is where the private sector truly can drive the activities. Look, when we were in Glasgow, I indicated that 1.5 degrees is a death sentence for many countries in the world. It still is. And we've reached there um, on occasion now, but it is the consistent 1.5 that is going to trouble us. We have to make sure that mitigation takes place wherever it takes place on Earth. The problem is, is that there's a serious disparity in the pricing of capital between the global north and the global south. Um, some of it relates to foreign exchange risk, some of it relates to lack of information and data, some of it relates to lack of confidence with respect to systems and rule of law, um, some of it is unconscious bias. And we have therefore to start where we can make meaningful progress and we believe that is in the area of finance. Um, the private sector funding that is probably needed will be about $1.5 trillion dollars which means that if we can raise at least 300 billion, 400 billion, we can leverage to be able to get that unlocked. As I said, it doesn't matter where mitigation takes place. And therefore, what we are trying to do is to see, can we go to Dubai, to COP28, with a record rather than a promise? And can we ensure that even if we can't make the full amount between now and December, we make enough progress that persons and companies can start with their projects because time is of the essence as we are seeing all over the world. There is no country that is now excluded from the impact of this crisis. And the reality is that while we focus on the increased capital for the multilateral development banks and the regional development banks to help governments with adaptation, it is that private sector unlocking of funding that is going to help mitigate and to keep temperatures below 1.5. Um, I do believe that it may require some countries stepping forward and not only putting in um, liquid cash, in some instances it will be SDRs. Um, we probably need a governance mechanism that anchors this trust or catalytic fund in the IMF and the World Bank because that then means that those countries that want to use SDRs won't have that as a liability on their balance sheet. But if we can get that done, while starting the scaling up of the capital of the multilateral development banks, um, in April this year we moved with the World Bank being able to unleash another 50 billion over 10 years. That was nowhere near enough. Last week the ambition I think is to do at least 200 billion over 10 years, we suspect that is not going to be enough. So financing will be critical, but at the same time, we're gonna to have to then look at regulatory issues and a whole host of procurement issues that have been disrupted regrettably by the difficulties with trade and the supply chain. Thank you very much. Uh, just a short question. Uh, there's been a, a lot of discussions um, around uh, COP28 coming up uh, in UAE. There's been optimism and there has been also um, some uh, more uh, reservations after the Paris meeting now. Uh, how do you look at the possibilities uh, for having uh, a real impactful COP, t not only taking stock, but making sure that uh, countries take on uh, more ambitions? I think that we have to recognize that the COP meetings are not a destination. And uh, this is just a stop along the way. The reality is that last week, Friday in Paris, I asked for and called for, and will be making the call again, that there be a meeting between the UNFCCC, the president of COP28, the private sector entities that are on the front line of the discussion, both with respect to loss and damage, as well as with respect to the causes um, of those companies that can perhaps help amplify the capital for the provision of a, an environment where we protect global public goods. 
um, and the global public goods will range from the climate um, and biodiversity losses being reversed to the issue of pandemics, to the issue of food and water insecurity, um, to the digital divide, to the fragility and conflict. Whether we like it or not, we cannot rely only on public money in our view. And unless people have a plan to live on the planet Mars, then they need to come to the table and see how best we can lift together. No one is suggesting that it is done in a way that bankrupts any company. But what we are recognizing is that if we don't all put our shoulders to the plow, we're not going to have enough money to be able to do the things that are necessary within the time frame that can allow countries to transition to be resilient rather than to face the tremendous losses that would otherwise be at risk if they don't make the adjustment. Thank you very much. Thank you for reminding us that we don't have uh, like a planet B or a second planet, even if we are um, acting like um, we have a couple of extra planets uh, there. Uh, let me then uh, move to, and, and uh, good, uh, welcome uh, to Dr. Ngozi. I will let you breathe a little bit before uh, we uh, come to you. Very happy to uh, see you uh, too. I'll then uh, move to Prime Minister Fan Min Shin, Prime Minister of Vietnam. As I said also earlier, uh, Vietnam is um, still growing uh, substantially. Um, Six percent, we expect, uh, this year, 8% uh, last year, and uh, let's also send, send a big thank you to Asia, because 70% of the global growth this year is coming from Asia. Uh, that's, uh, I think that needs an applause. Uh, and um, let, let's, uh, let's uh, make sure that we're able to keep uh, up the growth, but as you know, Prime Minister, uh, there are uh, not an uncomplicated landscape that we are faced with. Uh, there are possible new tariffs. Uh, there is uh, new uh, fractures uh, in the global economy. It is inflation. It is financial institutions having uh, financial problems. There is a war in Ukraine, all this. But what, what is the recipe for Vietnam when it comes to sustaining growth in Vietnam, but also what does it take globally to get us back on a better growth path than 2.8%? And then uh, for those that don't speak fluently Vietnamese, I suggest that uh, you take on uh, your uh, headset. I think it should be. Do you all have a headset? Okay, good. Let's uh, just put it on, and then, Prime Minister, we're all prepared. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. President and uh, all the panelists. I highly appreciate WEF choosing uh, Tianjin, China, uh, as the location and the venue for this event, because China as we know, it's the second largest economy in the world. And China has stood up and uh, built itself, built its status. Uh, and uh, they have had experience against braving the head, against the headwinds. And I'd also like to thank WEF and the host China for your invitation to attend this event. I thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chair, uh, to, for the opportunity to share with our discussion the thoughts and about your questions. I'd uh, like to go from uh, the most simple issue uh, from, uh, as you mentioned, and we are facing what are the challenges that we are facing and what should we do to address these challenges? Currently, what are the headwinds that we are facing? I think that we have six types of headwinds uh, hindering the uh, global development and Vietnam's development. First, 
the uh, uh, economic recession and inflation, which has uh, exerted great impacts on the lives of people. Second, the uh, adversities caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, it could be prolonged and it cannot be addressed in just a few years. Third, a geopolitical com competitive uh, competition, um, protectionism, decoupling, and fragmentation with a lack of uh, a cohesion and solidarity. Fourth, the conflict in Ukraine, which is jeopardizing food security, uh, energy security at the global scale, and other issues at the global scale that all of us here could feel the impacts of this uh, conflict. And fifth, developing countries, uh, could they have the uh, adaptability and responsiveness against the external forces? Their resilience is not as great as developed countries. Uh, in other words, developing countries are most stricken by the uh, external impacts. And six, climate change, disasters, and pandemics are posing great challenges to us. So I believe that these six issues are exerting great impacts to the world. And Vietnam is no exception. All of us here in this room can feel the, the impacts. And to address and to brave the headwinds, our approach is that uh, it is a global approach because the current challenges are having impacts on a global scale. And the second approach, it is causing impact on the entire people around the world. So we are taking an entire people approach to tackling issues. And how are we going to brave the headwinds? A number of key directions for us. Uh, of course, when we take a global approach, we need to have global solidarity and uphold multilateralism and an entire people approach, putting people at the center at the subject of change and uh, development and the resource and the drivers for all the measures taken to tackle issues. And to soon recover business, manufacturing and production to create jobs uh, for people and uh, increase investment and trade, creating capital flows and production and creating markets for our products. We are all responsible for this. And third, international organizations and financial institutions, for example, World Bank, IMF, WTO, need to take part in the policies. And they will have to have preferential policies for the uh, global issues that we need to address. And then we need to activate the growth drivers, the new growth drivers, for example, digital transformation, uh, green growth, a circular economy, and uh, the growth drivers are consumption, investment, including public investment, private investment, and FDI investment. And then we need to expand our market for export to remove tariffs and barriers and uh, uh, trade uh, protection uh, measures. Now, uh, some of us are increasing protectionism and tariffs, and we are seeing decoupling issues, and this is not going to address uh, global challenges. No one country can solve the issues alone. And as soon as there are still other people uh, infected with COVID, for example, we will stand the risk of being infected by COVID. So 
and then we need to also diversify our markets and we need to have preferential policies for developing countries because they need capital technology, uh, human resource training, and uh, improving of our institutions and policies and uh, advanced technology. And those are the areas that we need your support in. We also need a proper uh, solution to uh, to promote supply and demand and the confidence into the, mar into the markets are reduced. And we need to also in, uh, reinforce our monetary and financial policies to increase confidence uh, for the healthy development of markets. And as I mentioned, and to promote trade and investment, you know, uh, reduce the cost of uh, energy and food. And uh, for those who are better off, they need to have uh, better pricing to solve the global issues. And we're not going to uh, politicize economic uh, uh, issues. And uh, we're not going to encourage the factors hindering the uh, global development. And uh, those are what I'd like to share. And uh, then we need to also look uh, forward to uh, to look for uh, measures to address challenges and uh, conflicts. And in the 20th century, we have been through uh, wars that lasted for over three decades, so we understand the loss and the value of peace, not only for our own nation, but also for all countries in the world. Therefore, we need to be responsible for putting an end to conflicts and wars in the region and the world. And then finally, to increase public-private partnership and cooperation to create favorable conditions for businesses to develop. And for Vietnam, in the last years, uh, we, we start late, but we finish early. We had difficulties in having access to vaccines, but we uh, we established a vaccine fund and we conducted the uh, vaccine diplomacy policy so that uh, we could enlist the help of countries in addressing issues. And we also conducted free vaccination for the entire people so that we could gain coverage at an early age. We opened our economy in uh, December, in uh, October 2021. And uh, to the world, we opened in uh, 15 March 2022. We focus on three breakthroughs. First, infrastructure to develop critical infrastructure for development. Second, for improvement of our institutions and policies against the rapid changes. So we need to build our uh, measures from the reality, from practices, so that we could adapt to the situation. And third, to uh, train our human resources to meet the new demands of the new era, especially for digitalization, green uh, growth, and a circular economy. So those are the three breakthroughs. And, and uh, we are not going to sacrifice social welfare and social progress and environmental protection in exchange for pure, mere growth. And, and the people are always put at our center and the driver for our growth. Mr. and thank you for um, your uh, thoughtful uh, response. Uh, let me then move uh, to Chairman uh, Shang. Uh, we know, as also underlined uh, by the other panelists, uh, China is the second largest economy in the world. 
Um, it is a growing economy. Uh, we expect 5% uh, growth in China this year compared to 3% uh, last year. So uh, there is uh, a real recovery going on. But uh, as I also mentioned earlier on, uh, the global picture uh, is um, quite nuanced. So there are countries uh, growing uh, not so fast. Uh, we also see inflationary pressure. And uh, I think there is a lot of interest in what are the policies uh, China will take also in the coming um, months to secure uh, that uh, growth uh, comes back at a more 6-7% level uh, than the 3% um, level. So over to you, Chairman uh, Shang. Thank you. Speak English, but uh, I think I can speak better Chinese, so I prefer <laughs> to speak Chinese. Um, and you're in China, so. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I'm in Tianjin. Yeah. Uh, actually, Tianjin is my uh, home. Wow. <laughs> I, I work here for three years. Well, so you, well, welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. So you, you have no time. Yes. Uh, that's why I'm so happy to meet so many of my old colleagues, including many colleagues from the SOEs directly administered by the State Council. Uh, Chairman, you mentioned uh, that China is currently reviving its economy. We are on a relatively better trajectory because for a relatively long time in the past, China's contribution to the global GDP growth was above 30 percent. And uh, for all the developing economies combined, it's about 70 percent. Starting from this year, China maintained very positive momentum of economic recovery against the backdrop of multiple challenges globally. Uh, in the past few months, um, China has maintained stability in economic recovery. In Q1, we registered a 4.5 percent GDP growth. Based on the current consumption statistics, the growth is on a steady path of recovery. The total retail sales grew by 9.3 percent. And on the supply side, we see that some new products and new sectors are registering faster growth, sectors such as uh, renewable energy vehicles and EVs. In the first five months of this year, they registered an over 50 percent of growth year on year. The production of NEVs accounted for over half of the global total. For example, also the Solar PV panels, uh, we talked about green transition. Uh, other renewable energy forms, such as wind power, in terms of installed capacity, uh, they are seeing very rapid growth. So on the production side, we are also seeing very positive signs for a strong recovery. For the monetary supply, the growth of M2 was around 11 percent, which is reasonable. The uh, consumer price index compared to certain countries where they run high inflation already, uh, China still maintained a, around 1 percent CPI uh, compared to around 2 percent in the past years. I think this year we are fairly good. And uh, employment um, is also quite stable. For investment, the SOEs directly administered by the State Council uh, registered a 20 percent growth in fixed assets in the first five months, which is a very rapid growth. Nationwide statistics have yet to see uh, the data for the first five months, but for Q1, the growth was 4 percent in terms of fixed asset investment growth. Um, people estimate that in the first half of this year, 
Q2 will be better than Q1. The World Bank and the OECD and the IMF all put out their own estimates. The whole year growth forecast was revised up to 5.6%, 5.4%, and 5.2%, respectively. So these are the predictions made by the three um, international organizations. So um, people generally believe that uh, China's strong economic recovery helped boost the confidence in the global economy as a whole. But we also have to be soberly aware of the fact that we are not free from challenges. For example, in terms of foreign trade, the growth um, was below what we had expected. Because globally speaking, in the first five months, uh, it was quite modest. Uh, this is caused by multiple factors. And uh, also, we need to create more uh, new growth points for consumption. Uh, the consumption growth also was below our expectation. Uh, some emerging sectors uh, still need to be scaled up to generate a bigger impact. It is our hope that uh, through high-level forums such as the Summer Davos, we can build uh, and maximize our consensus to deepen cooperation so that uh, we can stave off the uncertainties with our own certainty and stability so that we can collectively contribute to a global economic recovery. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think you're so right that we have to rebuild trust. There is a huge global trust deficit. Just a short uh, question before I go to uh, Dr. Ngozi that is responsible for all global trade and getting our economy back on trade, driven by uh, the trade uh, engine. But um, I'm uh, wondering if we see new headwinds globally when it comes to growth and that will also have impact on China because uh, China is still um, an economy also um, pretty also relying on export. Um, so what kind of ammunition do China have ready uh, if uh, there is uh, a further slowing uh, down of the growth? I think um, the global trade Uh, has been growing slower than what people had expected. There are several causes. Uh, for example, the trade barriers um, that we have mentioned, which post new barriers to global trade. In addition, the policy coordination among major economies uh, could be better. And also, uh, we often hear the talks of decoupling and uh, related practices would also certainly impede in international cooperation in trade. Because if we follow the theory of comparative advantages, then different economies should fully leverage their own unique strength to engage in trade and exchange so that we can minimize the total cost and realize development for all. But if we um, go the other direction, then a natural consequence is a rising production cost and uh, certainly more slowdown in development. And another factor is that we're seeing very rapid technological advances in China, for example, especially among the SOEs and those directly administered by the State Council, there is a very strong drive for uh, embracing technology as a major innovation um, uh, source. But uh, globally speaking, we still see 
major barriers in terms of free flow of technology. Uh, that's why I think it's very important to enhance mutual trust so that uh, we can promote uh, the global economic growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for underlining um, what has brought us economic success the three last uh, decade, uh, the comparative advantages. I think um, this system has been questioned, but it doubled the global GDP in three decades and eradicated poverty as we have not seen uh, in the history of mankind. So coming to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ngozi, we know that uh, trade has been the engine behind this growth. Trade has uh, grown with around 6% annually in the last decades. We're seeing now trade numbers around 1.7%. Um, uh, two uh, percent, and we know that um, if we kind of decouple the economy, uh, I think it's um, IMF that has then said we will shave off seven percent of the global GDP. That's like a depression. Listening uh, to the panel, also seeing the global economic outlook now, um, are there realistic measures that we can agree on that can again revive? Uh, trade, because we know that there will be no real recovery without the trade and investment recovery. Over to you. Well, thanks, uh, Borg. It's true that the outlook, the growth outlook for uh, merchandise trade, um, we've forecasted 1.7% this year compared to 2.7% last year. So a full percentage point uh, below uh, what we, we saw last year. And um, so that, that is a, a, a very a, a problematic. Um, but at the same time, uh, we've also, uh, I want to, to uh, repeat what you said about decoupling and fragmentation. This situation of slow growth, slower growth in trade would be made far worse if the world were to decouple or fragment. And at the WTO, we actually did work um, uh, a year and a half ago to show that if we decouple into two trading blocks, it will cost the, the, the world 5% loss in global GDP in the longer term. The IMF estimates 7%, so we're all along the same lines. That's like saying that we lose the whole equivalent of the whole economy of Japan, which will be catastrophic uh, for the world. Actually, for emerging markets and developing countries, we've forecast double-digit losses in the order of 12 to 14 percent. So decoupling and fragmentation is something that the world simply cannot afford to have. And that is why we've been very vocal in saying that this is one thing we must avoid. Um, so um, that said, we are also, it's not all doom and gloom, but before I get to the not all doom and gloom, I just want to, want to mention one more headwind that we need to be uh, sort of conscious of. The World Bank has done some work and shown that the uh, long-term growth potential of, the, of both developed and developing country, emerging market economies, um, is declining. And that is because of some structural factors like demographics, which we don't often talk about, the aging populations in developed countries and emerging markets is going to exert some pressure. So we also need to be conscious of that and to be thinking of how we can harness areas where there's productivity growth, where we're going to see the young labor uh, that is going to help fuel the global economy. I just wanted to put that down. Now, let me get back to the fact that it's not all doom and gloom. So we also see some opportunities on the trade side. And maybe I'll just uh, uh, focus on three, um, one of which has been touched upon. I think for us on the trade side, the first opportunity we see is that we are trying to build global resilience in the world after seeing the vulnerabilities in supply chains during the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. So everybody is talking about building global resilience, uh, de-risking, but at the WTO we prefer to interpret de-risking as part of building global resilience. And uh, usually there's talk of trying to do that by, you know, 
going from China plus one or two other countries like Vietnam, and we, we like that. Vietnamese economy is doing very well. Indonesia is doing well. India is another favorite. But we are also saying that perhaps this is the big opportunity for the world to look at those areas, those regions, those countries that were left out of the first wave of globalization, <coughs> where there's really potential uh, for business to establish to decentralize supply chains to these areas, not just to a few countries, but then Latin America, you can look at uh, Brazil, for instance, you can look at some of the highland economies that may have potential on some areas. You, you, can, you can look at uh, Africa, um, uh, Morocco is doing very well, Senegal, Nigeria, my country, which is a large country. You can look at Asia, uh, South Asia, Bangladesh, so I could go on. My point is, let us look at those areas that are friendly to investment and see if we cannot decentralize and diversify supply chains in such a way that we bring these areas into the world trade, integrate them better. And that way we are going to harness the productivity in these other areas. And, and that will help to spur global growth. So that's one opportunity I think we should not miss. And I'd like the business, uh, business world to look at the, this potential. Um, so that's the first one. We are calling that re-globalization, re-imagining globalization at the WTO. And I think that's a very strong thing to think about. I think the second opportunity has to do with what is happening within trade itself. If we look at growth in trade, we will see that there's one particular segment that is growing really fast, and that is within services trade, there's digitally delivered services. Um, and digitally delivered services all the way from streaming services to video to uh, internet trade, all these services are growing at a phenomenal rate, about 8% per year, compared to 5.6% for goods trade. So that's where we see the potential. And it's really interesting because that can also be very inclusive. We see SMEs that are uh, involved in the digital area. We see youth, women who are harnessing this. So that's one area we should look at. And there are one or two things we can do. The rules that underpin digital trade are not yet there. And at the WTO, we are negotiating a set of rules for e-commerce that could help ensure that this would be a, a level playing field. We also need to look at the digital divide, how to bring the 2.7 billion people who are not yet on the internet in. But that is one growth area that is very, very interesting to, in trade. I think the last one is green trade. We are also seeing uh, trade in environmental goods and services um, grow. And that's another potential opportunity that I think we need to harness and seize. So these three areas are the green shoots, if you want to call them that. And I think we should, rather than dwell on the doom and gloom, we should turn our minds to how to harness these opportunities that are there that can help drive global recovery. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I, I think it's... Uh... It's, it's, it's very good to, at the end of this panel, to also focus uh, on the opportunities ahead. And uh, also, uh, calculations that we have done shows that 80% um, percent of the growth in the future will come in areas where digital services is part of the solution. But how do we make sure that the winner doesn't take it all in this context? Because it also has to be an opportunity for developing countries to leapfrog. But still, 2.7 billion people don't even have access to affordable internet. Can this digital revolution also lead to increased um, division and uh, also between North and South if we don't get it right? And how are we going to get that right, Dr. Ngozi? Well, you're, you're right. If we don't get it right and if we don't invest to bring those who don't have access in, uh, we could exacerbate inequalities. But I have one hope. When you look at those areas that don't have access uh, to the internet, somehow the young population 
uh, you know, they are more on the internet than the older ones. Um, you know, in Africa, maybe 25% of the people have access to the in internet, but 55% of youth uh, uh, have access. They find their way. So I, I think trying to um, look for affordable means, satellites and so on, to help provide that access in, in places that don't have it, and there are now less expensive <laughs> means of doing that. Um, that is one way. We are actually at the WTO consciously working with the World Bank now on a series of countries, you know, the poorer countries, to help them bridge this di digital divide. So I think we need to really reach out and invest. And it's a doable proposition. If we combine that with the youth access, then I have more hope that the younger generation knows what to do in terms of harnessing the digital technologies for the growth of their economies. Thank you. Um, we started five minutes late, so I'll add no five minutes to the panel. That means that uh, you each will have one minute for closing remarks uh, on an optimistic note, hopefully. So let's uh, start with you, Prime Minister, and then we move on. I think the global economy has a lot to look forward to. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressure on the global economy at the moment, uh, but one of the things we have to avoid is the temptation to look inwards and continue to look outwards. Uh, technology is providing us with enormous opportunity to lift the living standards uh, of people around the world uh, to create a, a much more level playing field to deal with issues of inequality with a speed uh, and, a, a, I guess, um, uh, with a, with a, certainly with a speed that we've not seen before. And so uh, I think as long as we continue to look to each other and we continue to cooperate and we continue to, uh, to promote a, a, an open and rules-based um, system for, for global trade, uh, then I think there's greater prosperity ahead for everybody. Thank you. Uh, that deserves an applause. Thank you, Prime Minister Hipkins. Uh, Prime Minister Motley. I think if ever there was a time for the public and private sector to work hand in glove, it is now. And if ever there was a time for the East and West to work together and the North and South to work together, it is now. Part of the difficulty is, is that we cannot take another crisis and decoupling presents that risk. Um, regrettably, it will carry certain countries over the edge. I think you've heard Ngozi make the point that in developing countries, the level of um, decline will be significantly worse than what you're seeing. At the same time, the opportunities that are there for us to be able to have strong activity as we prepare for making ourselves more resilient are patent. And similarly, the opportunities to be able to include as many people as possible. But you can't do that without dealing with basic access to electricity. So everything is interconnected. And if you can put the electricity in Africa, that is going to increase the number of young people using the internet. At the same time, the world has found out how to move capital. But the biggest problem, as you've just heard, is not going to be the movement of capital. It is also going to be the movement of people. And if we have declining and aging populations in countries, and in other countries, an oversupply of labor, then we will end up with the structural impediments to which Ngozi spoke. So I hope that we will, in all of this crisis, develop a conscience and a capacity to work together cooperatively and to see people who have hitherto been excluded from the development narrative. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister Pham Min Chen. Uh, one minute, Prime Minister of Vietnam. Uh, I thank you very much. I believe that uh, we need to have uh, international solidarity, like I mentioned, to address a few points regarding diversifying the market, diversifying our products, and diversifying our uh, supply chains so that we could address the current uh, challenges and to uh, focus on innovation for the increase of the uh, general supply and demand and to increase in trade and investment and, and then to uh, create more jobs and employment 
and uh, to focus on emerging sectors, for example, digital transformation. And of course, uh, digital transformation without electricity, without internet, we are going to fall behind and we need to ensure that. And then we also need to focus on green uh, growth to tackle climate change. And then we also need to focus on circular economy to protect the environment. Thank you. March, I uh, will go to uh, Chairman Chang and then to Dr. Ngozi. I believe uh, there are still a uh, great uh, potential for China to play a uh, big, en big engine for the world economy. There are still a lot of uh, room for policy in China. I think uh, uh, we should uh, have a confidence that uh, in uh, quite a long time, China will play a great role. So China and the, the world economy is a, a unity. So I think we should work together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on, um, on that also positive note and uh, also on the responsibility uh, China uh, takes uh, for reviving global growth. I, I turn to you, Dr. Ngozi, my, my dear friend. Uh, you can come with some closing remarks in one minute, and then don't, we'll listen to the Premier. Well, uh, don't worry, I won't be long. I just want to say that, look, I hope we don't spend so much time on the doom and gloom, and that we focus on the opportunities before us. Um, and, and they are there. Um, as I've said before, I don't want to repeat myself. Let's try to use the challenges uh, and see the opportunities in them. We can grow these economies by being inclusive of those who have been left out. We have a lot of business people here. Think about how to diversify your supply chains to other areas that have not been included in globalization, whether poor regions in rich countries or poor countries that were left out who have the right business environment. And there are many. I insist on that. There are many of them. Um, also, see what you can do to invest in, in digital. The opportunities are there. We've all, we've all said it. And green. So we can do all of these things and still tackle the problem of inequality in the world uh, by pursuing those strategies that are inclusive. So let me just end by saying we are optimistic and we hope we can persuade the business world and policymakers to also be optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would uh, like to thank uh, the panel. Uh, excellent uh, start of our summer Davos. I could not think of um, a more content-driven and optimistic uh, but realistic uh, panel. So thank you uh, for joining us uh, this uh, morning. And uh, we'll uh, now go uh, to the session where uh, the new premier will also share uh, his uh, views on China and uh, the global economy. So let's give uh, this uh, great panel an extra applause. <laughs>